As usual, we start every uh, event with uh, thanking the people who made it possible. And uh, I wanted to particularly thank our uh, festival intern, Amy. And then we have some intern understudies that I wanted to thank. Uh, uh, Helena Katz. <laughs> and uh, festival volunteer and understudy, uh, Charlotte Bear and Orion Lamas Bear. <laughs> Garbled bio, but. 
you go. <laughs> And he has a practice which he calls Donation X, in which he donates. It's a donated practice of, of uh, I'll let him describe it, but I was at, just asking him now if it was painting or sculpture, because he, he paints on um, stones in towns. Uh, and it's not a, it's a donated uh, action. I, I'll let him describe that a little bit more. So, called Donation X. Um, Victoria Stanton is a performance artist, video maker, photographer, and writer of fiction, poetry, critical texts, and songs. Her time-based work includes performance for stage, performance for the camera, actions in public spaces, and one-on-one -on -one encounters in intimate contexts. Her work is an investigation into the ability and the desire to hold a space, to appropriate and disrupt the quotidian, to create spontaneous intimacy, to tread vulnerability. Investing a performative presence and consciousness within multiple spaces times, she continuously underscores the complex aspects of transaction and the possibility for transformation. And last but certainly not least is Michael Fernandez. Um, Michael Fernandez was born in Trinidad. He came to Canada when he was 14. Um, first to Montreal, and then later uh, he moved to Nova Scotia, in Vancouver, Toronto, and then back to Nova Scotia. He's an instructor at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. And uh, I was interested that all of your biographies mention your sense of humor and lots of humor, and often refer to your work as low tech. Um, Fernandez creates social situations that actively solicit viewer participation. His work explores the intersection of private life with public space and the relationship between art and everyday life. Uh, he's exhibited and performed throughout Canada and internationally. His installations, performances, text space, and other ephemeral media projects are increasingly focused on live action that investigates how our daily habits and relations are often jarred by the unpredictability of life as it unfolds. Okay, so that's, I almost drew this camera. Karen has spent the last 10 days, well, nine, I guess. Eight, maybe. Nine. 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 Nine minus one, yes. Um, <laughs> to have that known 
because I, I really feel that we are at a point where we, as a collective, as a species, really need to sit and think and feel before we continue moving. Because I feel that we are in a, in a, a world that privileges movement without understanding what it is that we are producing by our movement. And um, so that is it was the root of, of uh, this project. And Paul was very generous in allowing me uh, to do this here uh, as a first trial. So that, that is how I came to, to uh, doing here. Is that yeah, well, you should say it's the whole collective because you were like about the whole collective. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because I was talking to Paul because he can't do that. Do you want to ask just to also hear that site? Yeah. I have worked a lot with, with places of transit, with, uh, with metros, um, with rambling with um, actually metro cars and I, I, there's something really really interesting and intensely beautiful about people who may have no idea that they're being watched and they are going somewhere and, I, and moving I love the way we move um, so, so there's that aspect and there's also just the aspect that I felt like this is if I'm going to make a statement about inactivity or taking a space that counters uh, our continuous movement that this is a perfect location as it's as a place that we go to to go somewhere else or a place that we go through because we are heading somewhere else. Uh, so a place of transition and movement um, I, I want to place a um, uh, presence of <clears throat> no, but it's, for those of you who don't know, it's not like I, was, I wasn't moving with it. Um, I was comfortable, I was sitting, if, if I was too uncomfortable, I would stand up and walk around. Uh, I would eat, pee, you know. Um, so it wasn't like one of those performances where it's like I'm being not me, it was really me in that space. I'm trying to occupy. And did you have conversations with people? I had conversations with some people who were moving through the space. I had conversations with the Red Cap um, personnel and with people who came and saw me. But you didn't initiate conversations? No. Um, it occurs to me that I should also mention that there are a couple of other um, projects. I just want to jump back a little bit. Um, to say that uh, Paul had framed up this kind of with the title Invaders of the Everyday. So we're really looking at particular performances that have, um, in a sense, um, inserted them or, or practices, not just performances here in the festival, but in the case of the walk and practices that insert themselves into everyday space. And to mention that um, Carlos Monroy and uh, Brian Connolly both had arts offsite. Um, market. Um, based performances as well, um, placing themselves in public space. So, um, is Carlos here? No. Nope. Um, okay. Well, if he comes in, we'll include him in the discussion. Um, okay, so I just want to ask each each person then uh, a little bit about that, um, a particular practice that inserts itself into the everyday. Um, so let me just stay with Karen for a minute. How did you come to this um, um, notion of performance? The space of um, I, I, I'm reminded of a, of a quote by Anne Sexton, but I, I, I don't have the quote, but it's something about how it's really important to be careful with um, words and aids. Because once broken, they are impossible things to repair. And 
while I was at the Union Station, I was thinking about this panel and the word every day. And I think that that word is on the verge of not being able to hold what we are ascribing it, especially when we put the in front of it. Because it's a, a temporal world, uh, word, and it's, if you put the in front of it, it, it loses, I think, what it, the context, because it's the context that makes, because there is no such thing as an every the every day. Um, that probably doesn't answer your question. Oh, no, we now have to do this. It gives rise to a bunch of other questions. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so let's just move on. So, <laughs> to, to Joachim, I just want to give everybody a chance to speak first. And um, uh, to Joachim's uh, practice and actually how he came to uh, what he's calling uh, Donation X. Uh, well, yeah, um, for me it was, uh, I'm, I'm running this festival and it, there was a performance artist who wanted to make something in the public space. And uh, she wanted to walk around and speak chewing gum in the street. And start, because they, they, they are fixing up a new law in, in Gatlinburg, Sweden, that you, you will, like in Singapore, would be fine under you if you speak chewing gum. So she wanted to make a work about this. And then I discovered that uh, uh, the public space is not existing as I thought it does. But the, the big companies are actually, they're not only renting a building, they are renting the, the whole world in front of them. They have the right to, I mean, they don't do it, but they have the right to decide who can stand. So, so, I, um, so this, I've, I've, been, I've been painting in the public space for a long time. Um, but then it became some kind of we called up old graffiti painters who now have been older and getting families and working as an artist. So we start some kind of little group. And um, because it's in, in Sweden also, they have this uh, zero tolerance of uh, street art, graffiti art. They really hunt kids with guns in the street. For, for. This uh, zero tolerance means that 24 hours after somebody made something in public space, it has to be removed. And it's a big fucking industry who earns a lot of money. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of group for this thing. So, so I talked to my, I had a lawyer, and um, we, we went through the law. And, and the law says that when you work with um, uh, permanent colors, like spray cans, um, permanent is philosophical. <laughs> uh, uh, then we came up with uh, water-based color. Then they can take us. So I started to go out in the public space and painting on something we have been seeing that is called common, the common. That we, we still owe it, but it's taken care of uh, by some kind of part department and stuff like that. <coughs> so I, I found uh, big clips, I found, uh, I went down to the uh, map, uh, map uh, department. You have to forgive me for my English. Um, try to follow it anyway. Um, so I went down to the, 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 the department of maps of the city and found out where these public spaces are, the common spaces. And we start painting there and, and, and after 20 minutes, you know, middle-aged guy standing on a road, 500 meters, nothing behind me, and then two cops, cars comes up, with, they, they draw their fucking guns. And I'm standing there with a little, little red wine and I put music in the end this time. <laughs> but that response from, from, from the city was like, shit, this is really important. So then I decided to make a bigger project of it. About two, two, three years ago. And so you've extended it now to other cities? Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it evolved. So we, I mean, I, I felt also that this is not only, this zero tolerance is not only uh, about. Um, uh, graffiti or street dogs because we are our festival we have a, we, we want to have at least 50 percent of all of the, the artworks in our festivals in the street we are for, almost forcing the artists to make one in the street and one in the, in the white box because we find this in, uh, and, uh, that's where we want to put the performance office 
So I felt like this uh, zero tolerance is, yeah, it's starting because they have this law against graffiti. But I, I think that this, uh, it, it, it will come spill over or not the soon. Um, uh, Victoria? How did you first start making work in public space? Can you talk a bit about your background, having that decision, or the chain of events? Um, do I have a phone? Because I do everything by the letter, I actually was communicating with Johanna by email about what I should be preparing, and I wrote something. <laughs> but I don't have to read it. I kind of, I should be able to speak about it without reading about it. So I'm debating whether I should just do like these folks and kind of just speak, or if I should be. I mean, I can't talk about the same thing. It's my security blanket. Because I thought after a week of being here and having my head full of stuff, will I be able to just spontaneously start speaking about what do you do? So it's there if I need it. So I won't refer to it, but I kind of came up with a narrative that I wanted to describe. It's not super long, just in terms of how I got to doing this kind of work, because I didn't just start going out into the world and making work in public. Um, what I did start to do was um, as a performer, I was doing spoken word performance. And the spoken word performance I was doing was basically saying in front of an audience, like we're doing here today, what I wouldn't have the courage to say in an actual real life moment to somebody when something happened that struck me as either unfair, uh, crazy, or a question that it posed. I felt like, in a sense, the opportunity to take events from my life and bring them into a public forum and speak about these things in front of an audience was a way that I was figuring out how to communicate with people. So I kind of learned how to communicate with people through uh, processing, deciphering, writing down, and then reiterating to an audience. So in a sense, that's my first art life experience. All the, the painful childhood and adolescent experiences got distilled into these short concise pieces concise pieces which I then speak to an audience. So you know life material was fodder for art. At some point though I had an opportunity um, to do a performance in a very small intimate space. Um, two two opportunities came in really close succession. One was in Montreal for a fundraiser event in a gallery where they set up tents for all the artists. This like little sort of three by three foot cubicle that the artist would occupy. So I went into my cubicle and had to figure out what I was going to do there. Shortly after that, I actually came and did a piece that Paul was involved with here in Toronto at the Gladstone Hotel before the Gladstone was renovated in one of those rooms. Those two pieces, which happened near each other, basically did the same thing. Without using many words, if anything, possibly hardly any words at all, I was basically doing the same thing that I had done in these spoken word performances, except this time, instead of saying something, sitting there as I was, completely terrified, um, I took the hand of the person sitting in front of me, and we were sitting with our knees touching, and put it on my heart, which was beating incredibly quickly because I was so damn nervous. And then the person sitting with me completely transformed. I mean, there was this incredible dissolution of two egos that took place. It might sound flaky to say it that way, but in the moment of it happening, I saw both of us together completely change. And this humanity that came out between us was something that I couldn't even put words on. That was my first experience of um, doing something, well, out in the world in so far as it wasn't in an art space, but in this one-on-one -on -one contact with somebody, which then showed me how this practice that I found myself that in fact is a practice of transformation. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm there for, I, what I'm doing. I don't mean that in the sense of hubris I'm changing the world doing, but I'm drawn to that work because I see that it has the potential for that. So that's when I started to move work out into the world in, in a wish to engage with people 
um, in order to keep kind of trying to find a stronger sense of humanity. And I realized also that it was helping me in the rest of my life. So in a way, um, and this isn't something, this is something that I've read a lot of other artists speak of in their practice, and I realized it was the case for me, that seriously, this art practice is rehearsal for my life. And then I go back into my art, and then it comes back into my life, and that's where I see how the two keep um, meshing and going back and forth, working one towards the other. So interestingly, one of the projects that I did do, this is sort of unrelated, but I've, two things have come up since I've been here that I feel like I need to mention it. One is um, the CMG uh, project that Carlos has done. Um, it, it reminded me of a project that I've been working on and I feel like I need to get together with him and, and talk business. Um, and I'll do that at some point, but yesterday or the day before, Johanna said, okay, uh, Johanna's been great giving your eyes everywhere for the last few days, so thanks for that. Um, but yesterday before we were leaving, Johanna said, okay, Vicky, we're ready to go. And I turned to her and I said, what inspired you to call me that? My family calls me that, but professionally, no one does. So she said, I just feel more comfortable with it. And then Johanna said, and I, I'm fine with that. Johanna said, Victoria, it's just, this is, this is, this is real, unwieldy name, and it is. Colonial. Colonial. Because I have this name that I feel like I never quite figured out how to work with, I finally one day woke up and figured out how to work with it. I created a bank, it's the Bank of Victoria. So I have a bank the Bank of Victoria, and that's been an ongoing art life project where I issue checks, I talk to people about their desires and their struggles with finances, I help them to realize their dreams by taking the first step, talking to me about what it is that they need or want to do, and in some cases, things have actually materialized after some of the conversations that I've had with people. So that's been an ongoing art life project. It's kind of on hold temporarily because my finances have, you know, been sort of on the wane, so I kind of, I have to figure out a few things before I can go and help others, you know, doctor here myself, so I'm in that mode right now, but, but, uh, um, the, 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 the stage-based work and the out-in-the-world work at one point seemed quite distinct in the work I was doing, but in more recent projects, they've kind of come back together. Johanna saw a piece that I did in June here in Toronto at PSI, where for the last two years I've been going from city to city when I have the opportunity to and doing a visual map of the place where I am to, in order to feel more oriented there. So I've gone from having these one-on-one -on -one encounters with people to having one-on-one -on -one encounters with aspects of the architecture in order to feel a, more sense, a stronger sense of connectedness to the place where I am. And then videotaping this doing an edit, bringing it back in front of an audience, and doing these actions that are a counterpoint with the images that are up on the screen. So there's another sense of performative consciousness in multiple spaces and times playing with expanding and contracting time that I find is a very prevalent theme in performance. Time moves really strangely when you're in a performance moment, and time moves equally strangely when you're traveling. And I'm seeing strong parallels between those two phenomena and trying to figure out a way to work with them. So that's been my most recent practice of doing these public performances for no audience and then bringing that in front of an audience and doing other actions in relation to that. And it all keeps coming back to trying to figure out how to live in this world that I live in, trying to find better ways of living, whatever that means, just so that I feel like I'm more together, sane, connected with the world, grounded, etc. That's the meaning of more, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Michael, when did you, um, when and how did you move out from being a painter into, um, I guess, ex extending or thinking that there might be other ways of Making artwork. I started off as a painter. This was uh, attending an art school, and uh, for the first uh, five years, 
I will explore exhibited his paintings. Um, gradually, uh, very shortly after five years, uh, the artist system in Canada, the artist run system, became available. And uh, I got connected through that system. That system I regarded especially, especially uh, important in my development. And it continues today. The idea of the artist run center then seems somewhat different now. For me, then it was uh, using a space to use more the emphasis on experimentation and uh, the, the idea of the laboratory. Um, there was this clause always and then, and still is for me today, you return the space in the way in which you found it. So this opened you up to do anything with this space. Prior to that, with my paintings, um, it struck me that the places where my paintings were shown were, paint, were places that the walls mattered. And uh, anything about the floor or ceiling retained the architectural kind of uh, concerns. It had nothing to do with um, artists being encouraged to use spaces outside of that practice. So. I think and then there were a movement, you know, people were dissatisfied and the artists banded together and to represent themselves. I think that still is very important for me uh, in my practice. I'm not waiting, I'm not interested in, uh, as an, an educator also, I'm not interested in dependencies. I do get grants, but I do function with and without them. I hope that I would always be able to. Um, I seek other ways of supporting myself. I have always sought other ways of supporting myself. Uh, in my practice, I'm interested in how value is assigned and what that means. And I think, uh, just to give you an example, I've always been uh, uh, kind of interested in how um, something that is new is unused and something that becomes used becomes uh, uh, secondary in price, you know, the price goes down. But then as far as art goes, the price goes up. So there's something about that relevancy that I'm interested in in my work, where that correspondence to uh, value is one that I, I bring dearly to uh, my life. All of a sudden, I switch from an object to myself. Um, in the time of being here and being on the road, uh, and being, uh, hanging out in the community, I have experienced a range of things. And uh, you know, that's, um, I imagine, as being anywhere in the world, being any place, um, from brutality to nice, gentle moments. And uh, I see that. Um, in myself, you know, I will call some sometime, maybe a couple of days ago, said if he wasn't an artist, he would be a criminal. Murder. Murder. <laughs> said murder. Um, I don't know what kind of murder he would be, axe or gun, but Cereal. murder. Serial. So it's serial. Okay. Um, that struck me. That's interesting. I couldn't thinking about myself and thought that uh, whether I have that kind of severity towards the practice or what is my dependency on what I do. Um, but it made me think about something. And um, I, in my work and in my place and being here right now, things affect me and um, from one project to another, I seldom know where it's going and what it's about. And, uh, I feel that um, a lot of times that I'm um, just feeling something out. When did you make that first uh, step into away from objects or into into a non-material uh, realm? I had a private. I had three private dealers: two in Montreal and one in Toronto. Really, when I was painting, I saw paintings. Um, that was great. Um, it helped me a lot. I thought that was uh, the way. Um, gradually, though, uh, 
the relationships with my dealer, I felt very um, stifled. And I felt that um, my dealer got into my practice uh, a month or so before the exhibition, and um, there was a certain amount of uh, pleasing, or, you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? So, um, that didn't, didn't work for me. I felt paintings were treated as commodity. I started experimenting more with uh, ephemeral matter, drove me to think of things that had temporal qualities, things that one maybe could assign value. But I think, personally, I think uh, anything could be sold. I think anything that I make, I could sell. I, I do have that confidence that I could sell. I believe I could sell anything. At the same time, my work is not sales driven. I'm not interested in that at all. I'm not interested in living from my work, for example. Uh, yet, I do know I can sell anything. This does not say that I sell a lot of work. I've sold fewer things that I've sold since not being a painter. But the market and that aspect of art, that doesn't interest me at all. And uh, that's not where I'm coming from. That's not where my head goes. Those conversations are not interesting for me. Um, maybe like Victoria here and Karen mentioned in the past, and also a friend here. Um, we all have an interest in making work that is uh, on some level uh, meaningful or work that challenges our own practice. We're not in competition, but in some ways we're aware we have an art history to stand on and it, it's a contemporary practice that we are involved with. And that comes with a great deal of, of information. And I'm very much aware of that, and I'm very much, when I work, I move with that awareness. Um, so a question, what made me uh, specifically, it's hard to say, it's an accumulation of things. You know, it's like, when did I become a vegetarian? I, I can't remember, I remember the year, but all the things that happened. Uh, I remember 1966, I was sitting down uh, on a step in Montreal. My brother, who's a Franciscan monk, um, comes to visit me. It was a Sunday, and um, he came from Tour Bear, and I was on St. Catherine Street, and he, he sat down. And my brother is one for, he's much more um, vocal than I am. He talks a lot, he has a lot to say. Um, the important thing about it is the quiet one in the family. And this is a joke, but this is true. So, in this, in this time, he did sit quietly next to me. He didn't say a word. And I felt a space. And I looked at him, and I said, What drug are you on? You know, what drug are you trying on? And uh, my brother is a Franciscan, and I could say this and he wouldn't mind. But he was also an experimenter in the highest degree. He took more drugs than I did. And um, I looked at him and I thought something had shifted. And uh, it was not just his practice. There was a sense of oh, his knowledge of being pious. He was ex I was experiencing a different side, a different quality of piousness that I've never exhibited, that he had never exhibited me before. So I really probed him. He started laughing and he said, no, I just got initiated. I said, initiated, what is that? What, what do you mean? And he said, uh, I took, uh, this was 1966, he got initiated into T, Transcendental Meditation at the time, TM. He became a, a student of meditation. So I looked at him and, uh, you know, long pause, and I said, feels good. Can you show me how to get there? <laughs> Give me an address. That was it. And I still do the practice. It changed my diet. And um, it's been a formal part, and I would say just as much as the artist run center in my life. You know, it's accumulated. And, uh, I, don't, I don't you know, it sounds like all of a sudden I start fossilizing or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to say everybody should go to you. No. I'm saying it worked for me. I'm not saying 
that. I got a technique, and uh, that's it. And I, apart from that, I have no skills. <laughs> Uh, two two things occurred to me uh, that seem to be that your practices have in common is perhaps this oscillation between fear and responsibility. And um, I guess you've all spoken about both of those things. Maybe I'll just go back for a minute to to your welcome to talk about um, the responsibility he feels to the to the city of Gothenburg, it seems to me, of the people, or perhaps it's Sweden, or, um, but there's a kind of civic, um, I, I get a sense of kind of a, a responsibility to civic space. Uh, and uh, the space of the city, or the urban, yeah, so the place that you live. And I was one of the artists that you made do uh, performance in public space, which I had never done before. And it was extremely challenging for me because I don't normally work in that way, which is it's great. It's really great to be challenged by a It was a great piece. She was uh, hitting Tiger Woods balls to the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your time. <laughs> We have this discussion uh, the first week about uh, Julian Fritz making uh, a hit on the national, the natives. What were you doing? Well, I was looking for my Swedish roots, which I don't have any. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Just to prepare. Yeah. So I don't know. I came across Ellen Nordgren and her nine nine iron, and just took it from there. Her mother is actually a member of parliament or minister. Anyway, I, it's not about me. It's about you and your <laughs> and your. So, so this idea uh, of ensuring that artists go out and, and are seen and make work in public space. So, I, uh, I've been thinking about it, and I felt it was my idea. But then, then during a wet night with my friends, I, in a discussion about this, I discovered that. My history is that I'm, I'm brought up in an artist family, both my mother and father were painters on the left wing and they were blacklisted and it was a big, I mean, when you get blacklisted in a way you always get isolated. And uh, what they did was that they brought, instead of going to the galleries, they took out the art to, uh, yeah, to the, the harbor um, and to the suburbs. And, they kind of, their contacts internationally was good, so they, they, they made a very big uh, miners. Uh, the miners' strike in UK was not uh, only a strike for money; it was a strike to the political strike to take away tattoo. So they made something about that and had a big exhibition tour and, and so on. But in Gothenburg to survive, they just wanted to take out the road. and they went out to the street. So of course, I I, um, I thought. Yes, now I'm going out in the street myself. I thought it was by myself, but of course it was. Uh, and seeing my parents doing it, helping them putting up the, the shit on the roads and so on. So, so, yeah, it's, um, it's a responsibility. I, I felt like more. Yeah, the responsibility as a citizen to, to make a stand or something. Yeah, absolutely. And Karen, do you feel that in your, in your work? And your work seems, in a sense, directed towards your own process. You know, you talk about wanting to sit for a year. Um, this word, uh, this word again, responsibility. Um, I, uh, uh, it came up a lot when I was doing the Metro Writing Project, which was a project where I wrote the Metro, uh, so it was not going anywhere. And, and, uh, it was a six month project and as the project continued I became more and more uh, invested in riding the metro and not going anywhere. But my grant was over because uh, it was a three month grant. So uh, my, I had two children at the time and my family and my husband uh, were like, well you're not being responsible because you've, you've done your grant. Um, and there's, 
kids up here and you're going down there and you're not dealing with your responsibility. And I had uh, a really long look at that word and what it means. And usually it means, the person who was saying it usually means you're not doing what I want you to do. But it, there's also something about um, finding your own responsibility in the sense of what are you responding to? What are you responsible to? And to a certain extent, we are all responsible. It's just that we're not all responding or responsible to the same thing. So are you responding to uh, the demands of society? Are you responding to um, the desire of capitalism? Are you responding to your own artistic practice? Are you responding to your, your soul needs? What are you responding to? And um, one of the things that I think it is really, like Johan, I think it's really important to respond to is this uh, growing understanding within myself that the world is, uh, capitalism is primarily a uh, system that is based on, on somebody being below and somebody being above. And to a certain extent, we are all above and a large part of the world is below, but even within our world, there are the below, and, and how do we respond to that? Because um, we are benefiting, and we don't really know, we don't really know where those limits are until we push against them. Until we're the man um, doing the graffiti with the police with the guns, or until you're the homeless person who's sitting on the, the grass who gets a ticket for loitering because you're not really allowed to sit on the grass, or your um, I don't know, I could go on, but yeah, that idea of, of I, th I think it's really important that we look at what we are, what we are responding to, and to not just take this word as, uh, as a meaning that generally is, is, the person who's saying it generally has their own idea of what, what, what it really means. Um. Michael, you were doing things with strangers. Uh, what do you mean by strangers? People I didn't know. People and I've never seen before. People on the street, people that don't know me. And why was that, was that, is that more important than doing that? Doing things with people you know? Well, it's easy. This should be easier, and it's not. You know, if you don't know somebody and somebody doesn't know you, you imagine a certain freedom. You know, um, this thing, responsibility, it's not, for me, it's not, um, I don't know quite what frame that is, you know, like what, or what, your frame with that. I mean, responsibility and work, I think, I mean, morality, I mean, these are things that I'm not um, thinking about. At the same time, I know it exists. I think. I feel we, we are affecting each other. I know that, but I don't know how. I don't know how, what, how to measure that either. And I've had examples of that being illustrated to me. You, know, you do something, and you never thought anything about it, or you say something, but somebody else takes that on. I mean, that for me, you know, when somebody asked me uh, last night, do you believe in fairies? <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> it's 
that's not the point. But I believe in prayer is or not, then you're not valuing that, that stuff, that, in, that, that, that content that I'm involved with is about something else. So I'm not trying to be evasive or even um, mm, difficult. On the street, I know that people are coming and going. It's, it's like Karen said, it is a train station. They're on their way somewhere, but there are also some people who are living on the street. Now, it's interesting that all those differences, it may very well be that their mind is somewhere else. The person who is homeless could be thinking about something else, not just homelessness. I don't think because he's homeless or she's homeless that home preoccupies him. On, in some level, I am um, in awe of that existence that I feel a closeness to that it's not, I'm not very far from. I'm never very far from. And I could say that I'm interested in work or I'm interested in living with that memory. For everything that I'm not from. And the street brings it out. Only uh, street work is unpredictable. It could go in ways that you never imagine. You're unprepared for. And how I deal with that is what I reflect on. That's the value of my work. That's how I see value. You know, I look back and say, oh, that's interesting. Look how I defend it, or how I, how, how I uh, stood ground, or how I, how I was in that situation. So I think a work for me, if and we are talking about vulnerability, you know, a sense of uh, openness, a sense of experiencing, if we can, some empathy, going to the other side. The impossibility for me is possible. And I bring that to, that's, that's something that I'm, I look for forward to engaging with always. There is nothing, like I said, I think anything can be sold. You know, it's, it's, I went out in the break, there's a store right across the street, it's a little thing. The title of the store is I Miss You. I could look at that and say, oh yeah, that's part of commerce. It's true. It's a clever sign. But, it's real. I could miss somebody. Somebody could miss me. And at the same time, um, I think I, we don't go anywhere either. Somebody kept telling me with this piece, this, this piece that I did here, turns out to be the most interesting thing I've done thus far for me, because people kept saying, this happened, there was a sense of frustration with some people. Michael, where are you going to be? At what time? <laughs> What's, what corner? And I'll be there. And I said, why, 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 why do you want to be there? Well, I want to see what you're doing. I said, you're experiencing what I'm doing right now. I'm here. I'm not lost. I said, I'm looking for you. I can't find you. I, three days now. I said, you found me. I'm here. <laughs> and I want to stop looking for me because uh, I'm not lost. <laughs> and uh, nothing you're going to find is going to inform you differently than what we are sharing right now. And I mean it. And if that makes no separation in my work. I'm all interested in that. I don't feel that this is what I do and this is what I am. I'm not interested in that. At the same time, yes, I have uh, models that have been valuable. I've watched this happen with close friends and others, where 
somebody has done something very great. Could be music, could be poetry, could be just in being a friend. And then they did something and they, no, that person. You know, out of my life. Now, how could you throw out something that was once valuable by that person, that author, who now does something as you feel as invaluable or something that, that was disappointing. You understand? But we are, we are doing this. We are, we are crossing it out. And I'm saying, you may not like this action. That's fine. You pick and choose, you know, what you can use. But that's, how can you, what can you say? It's like somebody writing something about the Catholic Church. So this is the Catholics. And the Catholics say, just remember, he's not a Catholic. It's very insightful, very telling, very, very meaningful, very uh, substantive, and yet, bottom line is, it's not a Catholic. I mean, you know, I'm using freely, I'm not interested in being anything Catholic, Buddhist, or anything. I'm not interested in organizations, I have no affiliation, and, uh, and yet, I mean, at the same time, it's value. If it works for you, Fine. You want to go out on the picket line? That's your way. I have my way too. Can you acknowledge my way? I acknowledge your way. I don't have to be on the picket line to be demonstrating. There are other ways of demonstrating, and I value that. And I've seen it. You see how it works. It works for me this way, your way. It doesn't have to be my way. But I want to I acknowledge your way. I wonder if people have questions. I feel like you're being very quiet and patient and I wonder if you want to, if you have something on your mind that you actually would like to address or, or if you have some questions for each other. driving forces of every aspect of every kind of work that I do um, in performance. And I wonder if I could articulate it in a very concise way. I'll try. I think ultimately This is fear. This is me conquering fear. Or, that's not the word I meant to use. I'm going to say that again. This is me sitting with fear. This is you and me sitting with fear. This is us holding a space. This is it. You're so scared up here in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. You're not scared in of course I'm scared. I, it's a new interview with how we talk about the art. I mean, I'm, I'm, um, I'm thinking more of maybe over the forms and sometimes because I can hear that when Victoria very beautifully describes what I also uh, encounter when I do the performance. Um, that is what she, I mean, I think it was a good what Jörg Fritz said the, 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 one of the first day. He said that when people are talking about performance, they, they kind of start talking about themselves in the way how they talk about it and what they are mentioning. 
I mean, the, one of the most beautiful moments in my life was when I was doing a performance in Sept. Uh, I was standing for hours with two ice creams in the corner. And uh, in the beginning, people felt like, okay, he's waiting for his uh, boyfriend or girlfriend and stuff like that. And, you know, they passed. Next time they came by, I was still standing there. And I was a lunatic, you know, and I was crazy man. <coughs> and so on. But the most beautiful thing was, it was um, a school class coming up uh, with autistic children that tends to visit this festival uh, more and more because they really like to, to uh, look at the work. And, uh, and this girl, she was kind of getting eye contact with me and, and, I, uh, and I, I felt like she was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You can lick it. And what I did is I just I, I, I put it out a little bit and see because she was looking scared. And what she did was she, she didn't lick, lick uh, my, my fucking ice cream. She was licking my hand. And um, that was kind of, I still got, Ooh, here comes the hair. So it's, I mean, I think that that is what I think that all, what we all, that is why we do perform. We have different encounters with different things that is differently important for us. Uh, uh, because I feel like when we do a performance, this is all, all, all again somebody else's word, but Elvira Santa Maria said that society today is built on fear. So performance is a space where you can fuck that fear for a few. You can do exactly what you want. And that's, that's I think that's the, that's the thing with performance. And, but are you, are you feeling fear here now? Well, there's a moment of, before I open my mouth to speak, happens every single time. My heart starts to beat harder in my chest. Now, I could have practiced what I was going to say. I could know it inside out because it's, it's something I felt intensely. I don't have to think about what I'm going to say, and yet it's a reflex. It's just there. And it continues to be there, but it hasn't inhibited me from acting, from being, and from doing. So, if I live with this fear, but I incorporate it somehow into what I'm doing, I actualize some kind of sweet, some kind of, it's not that it's resolved, I haven't got a desire to figure it all out, but a, a strong desire to just live with it as a driving force of some kind. It coexists with love, with compassion, and with uh, uh, um, a need for mutual understanding, um, acceptance, tolerance, all those things kind of sit together. So they play a role together in producing whatever kind of work it is at the time that I feel I have a need to go and do. So to give a really concrete example, um, I, play, I have played with in stage-based work, doing work that I guess borders on being abject. And it's, it's a hard, that's a hard thing to hold because people are in the audience kind of praying for you, basically. But it's really testing that limit of where's the compassion, where's the humanity? It's here, I can feel it. And that, that thing in the ether is a very strong uh, moment. And, and I remember one specific instance where I was singing um, I was playing an instrument. I really don't know how to play this instrument that I was playing. But I, I, was, I was just getting it and then a really huge fuck up took place. I basically fell off the horse and got right back on again. And there was a collective sigh in the room where everyone was holding their breath thinking, what's she going to do? How is she going to figure this out? And I was fine. I was fine. I was having a good time actually. And then everyone else realized, oh, she's having fun. Oh, we can have fun. And there was this really lovely little moment of, oh, this, everything's okay. Like, sh sh she's okay. I'm okay. We're okay. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then the performance went on. The performance actually took place in the moment where I fucked up, the big fuck up. Everything else was just on the side. That was the performance. So there was something about um, had, distilling that somehow through other kinds of performance acts, whether that's on stage or whether that's meeting people one-on-one -on -one or doing things in, in invisibility. So. Um, 
Laura, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I, it, it kind of bridges the conversation of responsibility and fear of it. Um, recently, I was I've been creating a piece in, in public space and uh, sort of where this question comes out of because I. You know, <coughs> having created stuff that maybe in public space is a little more whimsical and that that um, that is that <laughs> uh, that's that's meant to um, to jolt people out of their routine and maybe see the public space with a sense of wonder but in creating a group piece recently um, I was faced with with another performer who was we were working on actions that were more aggressive, and she was she brought up the concern of not wanting to scare people in uh, in public space, like to to jolt them out in a way, you know. When, and we were actually in the subway, um, and, and she had brought up the fact that um, you know that's a space that's contained where a there's an audience who hasn't chosen to be there, and b they can't leave. Um, so I'm just wondering, in your approach to creating work in public space, is that a concern of yours, um, or is that something that you seek to do? Do you do you want to play with that that risk of uh, of making people feel uh, feel scared or uncomfortable, or you know? That is a risk, but I'm not, I'm not aiming to make people feel uncomfortable. That's not my intent, but it does happen. But do you, edit your, do you edit yourself? Like, if you find yourself making people feel uncomfortable, do you pull, do you pull back or or adjust the performance? Depends. We have Depends. Edits. I think that moment is an interesting moment. If something is going on and it's seemingly out of control, you know, it's like that's where the work happens. So I'm not seeking to pre prevent that or seeking to protect that. I'm not seeking to control. But again, uh, two people, you know, there's a relationship there. I'm interested in that. Um, it takes two. You know, if the adjustment is a sense of restating the question or just relaxing but I think in experiencing it whatever that is not to, not to be dismissed I mean uh, and I don't think when I go out there I'm imagining that it's only going to happen this way or that way you don't know that's what makes the street vital that's the vitality of the street I have to be part of that, you know. Otherwise, I am wanting the street to be my way or some other way. Um, the interesting thing in your question earlier on, this I'm definitely not interested in. If you mean holding off the street, you know, like if you, if you say or holding somebody down, you know, it's physically. I mean, that would be interesting. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Now, can I do that? I may think that, why not? There may be somebody in my community, or maybe somebody in this world, I like this mother. <laughs> and yeah, and vice versa. And somebody in this world may want this mother me. I have to understand that too. It goes both ways. And that could happen. You yeah, um, we, we, it's two things. I mean, when I'm making my performance, I, I, I decide to break the law. That's, then I have to take the, the, the punishment, whatever it is. So, uh, but I, I think that's, that's also a way to push me. But when we are in, in the festivals, as we are organizing, like when we are forcing the audience to do something in the street, then we all, of course have the, it can't be fire. 
Uh, it can't be guns or knives, but the rest is possible. So then we just, what we, this year we had our volunteers, who is uh, almost as good as you here. Uh, they had some cards with questions. So when, when, they, when, they, when a pe person is making a, 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 maybe a, a too hard piece, like uh, Xu Lan Ko, uh, a Chinese artist, she, she was on the ground dressed in black with both her, her hands and feet uh, uh, tied up and with, uh, with uh, blindfolded. Uh, it, it just like it, it looks exactly like like from from Cambodia or from Vietnam war, but she is in Gatabon streets. I saw this piece inside, and it was it was interesting, but it was in in, in museum and it, it really really lots of work. In the street, it was so strong that uh, our guy who, who is documenting our films, uh, been working on television and traveling all around, he started to cry because he was back in Indonesia, he was back in Vietnam. Uh, and then we have people who is really take, I mean, we have a responsibility to answer up what is happening and uh, also to protect the artists and stuff like that. So, in that sense, yeah, yeah we have to. And they, 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 the court have different questions. Only why are you angry? Is this art? Uh, different things that could, you know, take another position, another direction for the, the person who felt something. So, so, yeah. But I also, I don't think. We should, I mean, for me, it's a way, we have to take the space back. Because uh, nobody's questioning all this bullshit you see that is flushing into your eyes. Buy this, buy this, I mean, don't just stand there. Do something, buy something. This house just around the corner, I mean, it's amazing. So, so, but nobody's talking about this commercial rape, this rape in our eyes every, every day. But when we come out, a little fucking also piece of art. <laughs> I think I think push push the limits. Don't be scared of doing that. I mean, what can happen? Yeah, and I would say that as well. That is um, where you will find the interesting questions of, uh, and and to me maybe it's more a question of ethics. Um, So I, yeah, I don't really know what you're doing, or but but to have that question uh, rise means that you are that you're somewhere, mm -hmm. and that you are actually either going to go more that way or you're going to back away. But that is that like you are somewhere now. Yeah. I would say like without knowing anything, <laughs> but um, yeah. and also I I just wanted to, pe uh, people are going to get freaked out because you're looking at them. Um, and, and like Jan said, we, we, we dump all kinds of garbage on the TV, we dump all kinds of things everywhere uh, that, that we, for, for an artist, I think we almost have a hypersensitivity towards what, it, or we have been trained to have a hypersensitivity towards what it is that we are producing in, as a response. And in one way, that is good, um, but in, in another way, if it, if it um, if it takes away from what you are being responsible to, I think it's important to, 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 to go there, but to try to be as, as aware as possible of, of what it is that you are, of what it is that you are producing, and to own it, yeah. But I, I bet you're, whatever it is, it's like at a really interesting point right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess I guess that you you kind of answered. So at this point, I guess it's more of a comment picking up on the idea of ethics. It seems to me like the relationship between the fear and the responsibility is, is actually a really intimate relationship, and, and and the fear and the responsibility are are kind of inside each other and and, and shape each other. Um, uh, in that, perhaps the responsibility is not something that is outside of the action, but but is a part of the action, you, you, you are responsible to the situation that you are creating. You are responsible to, to whatever it is that you're setting up. But you are not responsible for... for yeah, and so, exactly, so thinking about responsibility, not in a moralistic way necessarily, but, but in the sense that you need to be able to respond. You know, you need, like agency needs to, needs to happen, and perhaps needs to happen in which way. 
One thing that I think it, that is important is to be able to hear the, uh, the, the response of the other, and then to either shift or change your own. Um, think of it as like a, as a dance. You are because you have you have the freedom. You are the creator. You are you are the one who initially is setting up some kind of scene. Mm -hmm. So like. Yeah, don't get stuck. Yeah. Keep moving. No, I mean, as Just a performer, you, you know the con what the context and the frame is, right? It's the, it, it's the others that don't necessarily know that. Yeah, but you know, I think when you go to the, I think one of the things that's, that's really important is when you go to the street, when you do this type of work, is, is that the frame is not there mm -hmm. for you either. Mm -hmm. For you either. You know what I mean? Can I add something to what Karen? And you, and you were saying, um, this is something that Sylvie and I have talked about and that comes up in Sylvie's workshops. There's, there's an idea of peripheral vision. And your peripheral vision is extremely important because that's you being aware of all the time. And that takes into account who else is going to be in that non-scene frame with you. So it's basically reiterating what Karen said. We're putting another... Uh, method or strategy of working within that, it's being extremely tuned into what's going on around you because there isn't that frame of reference for anybody involved. So somehow this idea of peripheral vision is a way to keep being aware of moment by moment. It's not a global idea before you get there, it's when you get there. Where am I now? Then in the next moment, where am I now? Where am I now? Where am I now? And you keep, you're in that cycle of it the whole time that you're there in the moment of what you're doing. It's going to be one moment after another, after another, after another. I don't know if that's sort I think of thing, I, but well, I, I, I wonder, I don't want to dominate the conversation. Can people hear me? I'm interested in, in the importance of the witness, actually, at this point, because now we're starting to get into the questions of the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, what we're doing now, we have a new program that just started when I went here. I'm really happy and proud that we worked this out. But it's about uh, that there's five to eight performance artists and a couple of students who have been starting to practice uh, performance are uh, making a uh, kind of um, Invasion. Yeah. Um, the school, it's a school with uh, four or five hundred kids, um, different ages, and uh, we, we are taken in by the teachers to do something. And it's a full day, six hours performances. And we just start sneaking in on the schoolyard, in the corridors, in the, where people are eating, and just do performances in different ways. And we had the idea that we can do this in silence. But the kids were so so uh, on us. So it, after 20 minutes, you have like 50 kids hanging in your clothes. <laughs> and then, I mean, of course, you have to respond. We couldn't we couldn't do what we thought we could do. So we had to we had to answer them all the questions, sit down and explain. And afterwards, we were going through all the classes and explaining what is performance, what is this. So, I mean, it's, it's a different situation. I, I think that you can leave people in the street. It, it doesn't matter. That's, I don't think that they have a responsibility for other people. So, I mean, for some people, uh, uh, a melon is something that to eat. But, but for the guy who was tortured by his father for 10 years, who put up a melon on his face every morning, it's something else. So, some of these responsibility things in the street, I can't, I can't really feel that. that uh, that what this person is witnessing is, um, but if I see it, of course, I'm a human being. If I see somebody's getting freaked out on something, of course you have to. necessity of a witness and you Karen we spoke briefly about 
for your piece on a personal level for me, I often thought about it, but it was never realized physically for me. But it's still, it's still. So I don't know if I'm an audience member to that piece or not, and I don't know what, wondering as artists what the necessity is for you, and I think maybe with your public painting it's a bit reversed because as opposed to, uh, why is it reversed? Because the, the product is, is going to be witnessed afterwards, as opposed to, mm, no, I don't know what I'm talking about that. But I guess I just wanted to hear you guys, yeah. No, we're a conversation on the street. A conversation on the street. A conversation on the street. Um, Who's the witness? Depends on the situation. Right, and how do you view that? Like, do you view, I don't know, I feel yeah. that I make one-to-one -one yeah. pieces that I am not, the artist. I mean, maybe I'm a conduit, maybe I set up a situation, but yeah. you become each other's witness. Right. right. Your witness, participant, it keeps going. So then what is it when there's no one there? I was talking with Martin previously. What is it? Like, is it you mean, what is it like art? Or is it just like two of them were there? Yeah, but what, you know, okay, so I just did a piece where the audience cycled through, and there were times <coughs> where I was alone. And I always have this question in these moments. Like, holy shit, am I insane? Why, like, why, why am I doing this if there is no one here? Is this, this is performative? But I would never stop, never. Like, but I have that split second. So, I don't know, I, I guess I'm wondering with the necessity, and also with your piece as well, the concept of witness from, oh, sorry, Karen's piece, the concept of witness from afar is, is intriguing to me. Maybe that's not a specific question. For, for me, that doesn't matter. I'm not interested in that. I don't do that. I don't do that work where it's an inquisition. It's not, yeah, you're talking about something that you actually constructed uh -huh. by understanding it, apart from what's going on in the street. Yes. Right? I'm not interested in that on the street. So you're, you're. I'm interested in being on the street like you are on the street. Without you, a certain invis invisibility. Right? That, to me, that's a different kind of witnessing. It, it, it requires a different kind of participant. You know, the participant to witness is not necessarily the participant to engage. You know, people could be just standing here and looking. They engage. Witness. But what I'm talking about is like doing things with strangers. That's not happening. That never comes up. Unless you eat dropping, you know, I'm talking to somebody, asking them for directions, and you go back. That witnessing can happen, but that's not the purpose of it. For me, that's not the focus. Yeah, no, the focus is at that given time, asking this person for directions. So I'm listening to this person, this person is directing me, and I'm picking up on the signs and the gestures and the language. That's what the piece is about right there and then, if that's a piece. Me. I just want to mention that both of the, our, our writers, not me and Daniel, wrote really beautifully on this topic, on the blog, and I really encourage you all to to check it out because, you know, I think uh, both Michael's and Karen's pieces provoked really interesting questions around this and about around the inclusion of this kind of work in a performance festival and all of that. And they both both uh, took those questions very seriously and very wrote very eloquently about exactly this. So, you know, I just want to... I mean, want to point you there for yeah, a minute. I mean, something I could say, but uh, this is just for me. The performance, the word performance, in relationship to what I do, is more interesting when it's not performed. I'm looking, person, as, as the activator or the author, I'm looking for non performance so when you describe that situation just now, and I said, I'm not interested in that, I mean, that seems like I'm a performer to me. I could be wrong, but that's, that's how I interpret that. I'm not 
seeing that as being the kind of performance I'm interested in personally. I mean, maybe it works for you, but this question is for us all as the viewer. I'm just describing my situation in relationship to that. It's different. Well, then what's the difference between that and going to the grocery store and talking to the checkout girl? No difference. Right. <laughs> Andy, has got a question? Andy? Um, I have a big voice, but if I need a mic to be recorded, I'll take a mic. Um, what I, the, the discussion we just had around the word performance in some ways begs the question of like what is elevated above, quote, the everyday. Like performance stands, does performance stand above or within, quote, the everyday? But Karen, you and I chatted at a blank at Union Station on Friday, and I have a block around using the definite article in front of the word community. And you tag me and say, well, why do I use the definite article in front of the everyday? And I'm convinced you're right. Like, what is the everyday? Is there a singular everyday? or? Why are some things every day, and why are some things above or outside of the every day? Can you take that further? Yeah, um, and, and, and to get back to your question, for me, there, uh, um, what you're doing in the room, what I'm doing sitting, um, is a position that you take that produces either something within you um, and it, to a certain extent within the people who pass through, within the people who see. But the most, for me, one of the most amazing things about uh, the framework of, of um, this conference or, 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 or the festival, the framework of what, what we have, what we say is art, what we get to put there, means that the audience is not, there's many audiences. And yes, you are an audience. Even if you never see the piece, if you know about the piece, because it plant, to me, it plants a seed. I have a, I can visualize, oh, this, I can visualize you sitting in that room with nobody coming in, and that produces something within me. And then it enters a discourse. And it, it, it's, a, it, it's bigger than us, it's been going on for a long time, and I, I think it will continue to go on for a long time. And to me, that, it, it, it's the language, it's the, 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 the images, it's, but it's also what it, but I also believe it, like I'm, I have a tendency towards conceptual, but like an embodied conceptual, which is like a, those two words don't go together either. Because um, I think, I, I, for me, there is something really important about living what you believe, living what you say, even if it only enters discourse through the written word, through the language, through, through the speaking of it. And living what you say is another form of responsibility. I thought. <laughs> and and sometimes the, for I, I have been working a little bit with what I put, what is called furtive practices, and sometimes the own there's only one one person who knows, and the sense that you carry within yourself is that one person who knows this other person's action, this other person's work is. And uh, to me, it's un the, the the feeling I have is of that that hair raising on the arm, of the the lick of the hand, and um, but <laughs> I think it's always interesting when when it goes in when like maybe ten years later, two years later, it comes out. Into the because it, to enter the historical discourse, it has it, it does have to be shared with more than one person. But I encourage you to think certain things seem to need to not be spoken of. 
to have the power. And I, to be sensitive to that, I think, is really important. It brings it back to value. But a different kind of power. Yeah. I'm valuing a cup of coffee right now. <laughs> I think, obviously, everyone can stay and we can talk and we can kind of break up this. Uh, but even if, if about but public space. Joachim wants to have the last word, I so like I will. <laughs> Being so quiet. Uh, no, but I, I, I actually think that I rather meet the police than the old police. Odd police. Have you heard about that? Uh, the people who is always saying that that is fucking that is. I have. I, I mean, I rather meet the policeman in the public space than the odd police in the odd space. That was my last question. <laughs> okay. Thank you all.